Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. We came back live yesterday after being gone on our first time ever trip to Israel. And as promised, we want to continue to talk a little more about that like we did yesterday. When we arrived in Tel Aviv, it was like two o'clock in the morning after a 14 hour flight. There was a shuttle bus there to pick us up and take us to our hotel in Tiberias, which is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, we started off the very next morning. Uh, we in this particular tour, there were a lot of early morning uh, wake-up calls, and there were many, many, many stops throughout uh, the day before we returned to the hotel for supper. And uh, the first thing in the morning, on our first morning on the shores of the Galilee, they put us on a boat. Actually, there were two boats uh, anchored together, and they pushed out into the Sea of Galilee, and Steve Swanson... Uh, led in worship after the organizer of the tour and then Steve Schultz of Elijah List uh, said hello and welcomed us and uh, it was the the organizer, his name was Bo uh, he really started out well on a spiritual note he, he said to us, he said this is going to be for many of you a once in a lifetime uh, visit, just forget all the things that are going on back home, uh, put that out of your mind, and just be here in the moment Amen. on the Sea of Galilee, and then throughout the other things that we did, and it was really uh, a blessing. During the time that we were there, we, we went to several places on the Galilee, like Kitty said, we got to baptize some folks in the Jordan, awesome. and uh, we went north of the Galilee into the Golan Heights. Sorry, that's. I'll take care of that. You guys. Don't talk, don't talk. Never Sorry. mind that. Hush. Hush. Never mind that. Uh, we went north of the Galilee. The as far north as we went was Caesarea Philippi that I talked about yesterday. And on the way, we we were up into what used to be. Syrian held territory and passed several Druze villages. I really didn't know much about the Druze people. They are a religion that started after Christianity and after Islam. They began in the 7th century and they were an interesting bunch. We ate a meal in one of their villages when we visited Mount Carmel in the west and but we we covered during the tour the far north all the way down to not quite furthest south, but down to the southern tip of the Dead Sea. We were in the West Bank quite a bit. That was a big shock, like we said yesterday. The Dead Sea is not some apocalyptic, war-torn uh, area choked with refugees. Uh, we were right there, as I mentioned yesterday, in Ramallah, or outside the outskirts of Ramallah, and not probably not a mile from Ramallah, there was a school filled with elementary school Jewish children that were waiting for the school bus and teenagers in high school waiting for the school bus to take them home uh, in a village right outside uh, Bethel where Jacob had his dream and where Jeroboam, if you remember our Bible study, where he built the, uh, the altar with the golden calf. And so the one thing that really stands out is the narrative that has been fed you and I in the news for decades now about conditions in Israel is, is not the evident truth whenever you get there. Not just because of what somebody tells you. Uh, the tour guide was very informative by what you see with your own Eyes. You see Arabs and Jews and Christians uh, invested in the area trying to live together. Mm -hmm. 
the preponderance of those people want peace. Mm -hmm. They want peace for their children. They want peace for themselves and their businesses. And uh, our tour guide has been doing this since the 1970s. And he said in all the years that he's led tours, he's not had one single incident of any issue of safety or lack of security for any of the people that Amen. he led. And uh, that was a real eye-opener. And we'll talk more about it. Uh, as we go along, go ahead, Katie. I wanted to share this morning about one other little trivia thing. For those of you, like Russ and I, we had no clue about this. Because I told you about the date palm trees, plantations full of groves and groves and groves flourishing in Israel. Well, there's also these massive orchards of olive trees. And the olive trees are everywhere, including the Garden of Gethsemane where we visited. But everywhere, olive trees are growing. So the, the tour guide said, do you know the difference the different kind of trees for the green olives that you eat and then the black olives and everybody went no 50 of us on the bus no well he said it's the same tree we pick the green olives at a certain point when they're green and they um, flash freeze them and put them aside to prepare them for the way they're going to um, season them and then they let the rest of the olive tree come to full fruition, and they're, they're black then. And we had no clue that that came off the same tree. Isn't that a little bit of fun for you? Yeah. And that was right outside the city of David after we came up from the Gihon Spring, which is actually in a cave, and we saw Hezekiah's uh, tunnel there underneath David's uh, palace, and then we came crawling out, or we didn't crawl, but it was quite steep, Yeah. and uh, we mm -hmm. were all pausing for a moment under these two beautiful old oak trees next to a wall that dated to Hezekiah's time that the Bible said Hezekiah built, <laughs> and so everywhere you went, uh, one more, just one more, and I don't know that mm -hmm. I mentioned this yesterday, but we went to the upper room where the Last Supper was held, and which consequently... It is certainly believed that the uh, upper room where the Pentecostal mm -hmm. experience was poured out, and underneath it was a synagogue with a chamber that was the tomb of David from ancient times, believed to be the tomb of David. Everywhere we went, the guide didn't just say, oh, this is that, and I expect you to take my word for it. He actually discussed it. He said, this is why they believe this is that location. And they had criteria that archaeologists go by mm -hmm. uh, to before they can actually make the assertion that this, to for all intents and purposes, everything they know from history and archaeological inquiry, this is that location. Well, when you walk into the synagogue where the tomb of David is underneath the upper room you walk through this other area that's it's walled on three sides and it has a ceiling over it and a floor of course but it's open as you walk into it there's no wall well I looked it up later and found out of course now the the place of the last supper is above you that later uh, I found out that it is believed that in that open area where you walk in to see the tomb of David is where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And Amen. Boy, that just really spoke to me. Amen. So and, it's uh, fun to be able to share some of those things. I know we're here to study chapters, but it's the content that we're studying about, the very place where we're privileged to go. And we, you missed it yesterday. We're planning a trip for the year 2020 in the summertime. So start saving you now. You need to put and, that in your mind. Yeah, we'll, we'll give more details as they develop. And then just an idea of, of cost. Now, we don't know what the cost might be for the tour that we planned, but the tour that we went on was less than $4,000 a piece, including airfare. Airfare from a and, major uh, airport, you have to know that. Um, yeah. For us in Arizona, we had to fly on our own San Francisco, but others flew out of New York. So you just keep yeah. that in mind. This is pubs. airfare, lodging, most of your meals. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, For 10 days. So put that, put that in your mind. Put that in your heart. Uh, it, was, it was very gratifying to go there. And it was gratifying to get the sense that uh, I always thought that you know, they just had a tourism bureau that decided, well, we're going to say this is there and bring these tourists here and take their money. Uh, that is not the case. Those tour guides and the tourism ministry in Israel, they are very sober-minded about where they take you, what they show you, right. 
Right. Uh, they're not just, and they were very respectful. Our, our tour guide was not a born again believer, uh, but he was very respectful and not just saying something because he wanted us to hear it. He actually had revelatory understanding yes, of things did. related to Jesus that he communicated in a very heartfelt way Amen. that just really touched touched us. And so today we are studying in John chapter 11, Ooh, part 1. Lazarus, uh, yeah. Lazarus, <laughs> come forth. Kind of felt like that when I woke up this morning. Mm-hmm. Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> Are you ready for a Lazarus solution in your life? Amen. Do you have hopes and dreams that are dead and stinking? It, well, you know, if you look at a situation in your life, say, that stinks. Well, you, you're you ready for a Lazarus solution. Come on. As Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in our chapter today, even so, that same resurrection power is available to you and for you in whatever situation you might be grappling with and the one great lesson that we'll have today part one tomorrow part two in john 11 is that it's never too late amen uh the biggest opposition that jesus gets in the situation that we're going to study today and tomorrow is not just from the jews who were angry enough that they really resolved in their mind that's it we're not just going to think about it we're going to kill this guy because they didn't like what he did but from those that were some of the closest friends that Jesus had that opposed him and didn't want to face the inconvenience of their own unbelief. And so it's, it's a it's very helpful uh, study today that's relevant to our lives. And Kitty, I'd like you to read verse 1 through verse 37. <clears throat> Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, whom thou lovest, he whom thou lovest is sick. And Jesus heard that, when he heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. His disciples saying to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there's no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in They're, the... they're trying to be spiritual. Yeah. They don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> you know, oh, well, let's go die with this him. This is all temporary. Can't you see Jesus just kind of rolling his eyes? <laughs> you, know, you knuckleheads. <laughs> You rascals, you. (laughs) Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? 
She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Okay, now why did she call Mary secretly? Now, the word came to the house that Jesus was there, and Martha went out and left Mary behind. Not because Mary didn't want to come, Martha didn't tell her. She didn't like how Mary acted around Jesus, so she wanted to go get the situation under control so that Mary didn't embarrass the family. And now she doesn't like what Jesus is saying, so she leaves him and says, Oh, the Master wants to talk to you, but she does it secretly. Why? Because she's embarrassed about Jesus, and she's embarrassed about Mary. Well, verse 29. As soon as she heard that, that is Mary, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come to where, come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Thir- 35 says Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that this man should not have died? So in chapter 11 here, we find Jesus traveling to Bethany from the Jordan. Remember, he left the Solomon's porch in winter uh, because the Jews were picking up stones to stone him twice. And so he goes out to the Jordan, which we've, we've made that drive. It's, it's not a hop, skip, and a jump. And he goes out east to the Jordan. Many people follow him from out of the city and believe upon him. And then he gets word about Lazarus being sick and so he begins to move toward Bethany and he, he, the word that he receives is he whom thou lovest is sick you look that word up it, it has various meanings but the emphasis here is uh, he who you are fond of is sick in the gospels we find that Jesus more than once spends time in the house of Lazarus with his sisters Mary and Martha. Now these three, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, did not travel. They were not uh, disciples among the twelve or even among the seventy, and they are not known to be in any of the multitudes Jesus ministered to on occasion. These were Jesus' friends that he had relationship with out of affinity and fellowship. You know, it's been said, I've heard Kitty say this, that God loves everybody, but some people he likes more than others. Uh, could this be true? You know, in Western thinking, in Western society, we tend to expect everything to be fair and egalitarian. <laughs> if it's not fair, then it's not God. And, uh, but that's, that's a modern convention uh, in the kingdom of God. It just isn't always the case. And let me give you an example. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. In fact, Paul makes the point that this was true even before these boys were born. Now, does God really hate Esau? The word hate does seem somewhat strong and if you study the word meaning originally it's 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 the more temperate translation would be Esau have I loved less now why would that be because Esau despised his birthright while Jacob for all his flaws Jacob was a liar he was a cheat he was a supplanter but if for all of his faults he had respect of the covenant that Abraham had with God in James 2.23 and in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 7, we see that Abraham is called the friend of God. Now there are many Old Testament figures who had a relationship with God before Abraham, like Enoch. But Enoch 
He walked with God, was not for God took him. Uh, Enoch was like uh, like a pet possum. Every time God <laughs> turned around, there was Enoch. It's mm-hmm. so like I learned about Enoch when my little boy, about three years old, he was following me around with his overalls, his red cowboy boots, and his plastic guitar. And he just wouldn't go away. He was following me, and I had to get down to the office, and I just reached down, and I grabbed him by the suspenders of them overalls, and I put him on my hip. I said, why don't you just go with me today, son? Because he was just going around tugging on my pant leg, saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. (laughs) Well, the word haunt, Enoch, walk with God, means he haunted God. He was hanging out where God was, but yet Enoch was never called the friend of God. Um, think about uh, Enoch think about uh, Noah Noah was never called the friend of God and he was the only righteous person of his generation so these individuals such as Abraham and Jacob these were in, in the same regard that Lazarus and his sisters were held in the ranks of by Jesus they were Jesus friends just like you and I can be a friend of God, not only recipients of his grace, but to be found in his favor, to have the fondness of God. Now, what do you mean fondness? Well, parents that are fond of their children is like the parent in the Walmart on the backside of the women's clothing, and that kid is screaming and hollering because he wants something, and he's just distracting the entire store, and everybody in earshot is thinking, why doesn't that mother discipline that kid? It's because she's foolishly fond of him. Mm -hmm. And there are love words in the Bible relating of God's affection for us that are just like that. He's foolishly fond of us, which means he's not going to discipline us when everybody else thinks he ought to. Why? Because he's fond. There's a favor. There's a different approach. God doesn't have that kind of fondness for everybody. So Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick, and he just says, well, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. And theologians, what they do with that, they see there, they say, see there, God put this sickness on Lazarus to kill him for the glory of God that came after him. God set him up to die in order to demonstrate. It's, that's like kabuki theater. How, how can that possibly uh, be? Theologians and teachers contend that this means God put this sickness, whatever it was, on Lazarus for the purposes of what happened after. Now, isn't that interesting? To suggest, can you imagine doing that to one of your children? I'd be visiting you in the penitentiary if you did that. To suggest that God would deal a death blow to Lazarus, one with a special relationship to Jesus for the purpose of demonstrating Jesus' resurrection power. Now just ask yourself, is this consistent with the character of Christ referenced in the Gospels? And everybody wants to quote the Old Testament, but remember Hebrews chapter 1 says, In times past God spake through the law and the prophets, but now he has spoken to us through his Son. That means that the life and character of Jesus is an interpretive lens through which we filter our understanding of the things of God. You can look in the Old Testament, God struck somebody down. Did Jesus ever strike anybody down? Then we need to get that out of our repertoire. We need not to accuse God of doing that, and we need to stop trying to do that ourselves like some little strutting apostolic Napoleon. You're going to a call for somebody to die, those things have a boomerang effect. I've seen people that spoke death over others that had death visit them because they opened their mouth unadvisedly. But to suggest that God would do this, let's think about the following verse. Jesus, Luke eleven eleven. He said, If a son asks for bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent or anything that originates with the serpent? Will God ever give you anything that originates with the serpent? I think not. (laughs) See, what does that tell us? We'll say, yes, but God in his ineffable wisdom. Hold on now. Hebrews chapter 1. God spoke in times past through the law and the prophets, and you can see some things like that. 
in the Old Testament, but God is speaking through his son. The life of Jesus is an interpretive lens through which we filter our understanding of God. Did Jesus ever do that? Not one time. He didn't lay hands on anybody and strike them dead for the glory of God. He never did it. And to suggest that God does that, you're not serving the God of the Bible. You're serving another God. I don't care what the excuses are for coming up with that kind of thinking. When the disciples tried to think that way, he rebuked them in Luke 9. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy, but to save. So it suggests, see, what, what does this tell us? It suggests to us that it's wrong to impugn the character of God with such despicable actions. Jesus presses his point in verse 13 of Luke 11. He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So in other words, if you wouldn't give your children cancer, If you wouldn't let your 16-year-old die in a fiery car crash because you knew down through time that 16-year-old would turn away from God, spend eternity in hell, and so you're you're just going to go out there and sabotage their vehicle so they'll die before their time, you go to the penitentiary for that kind of stuff. Why do we accuse God of doing such things? If a father infected his child with a deadly pathogen today, they would go to prison for child abuse and worse. Is God a child abuser? Would any sane father or mother treat their child in this way? Then why, in the light of the testimony of Scripture, do we come up with this profane ideation that God will do such things? James says this in James 1.17. He says, every good gift... Is cancer good? No. (laughs) Is... is, uh, Your child under a headstone in a cemetery, is that good? Well, then it's not God. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shout of turning. They say, yes, God's good, but sometimes, so you're accusing him of having variableness. You're accusing him of changing his mind. Oh, yes, God is sovereign. God will deal you a death blow uh, if he sees in his sovereignty that it's necessary. Okay, I understand that thinking, and you can quote scriptures, but you cannot quote anything from the life and ministry of Jesus to justify that. And Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, in times past, God spoke through the law and the prophets, has now spoken through his son, and if Jesus wouldn't do it, then it's false doctrine to accuse God of doing such things in the dispensation of grace that is bounded by and set in the parameters of the shed blood of Calvary. God is a good God and his gifts are good and perfect and there's nothing good about dying. There's nothing good about disease or disability. God never varies or turns from what Jesus in John 10.10 calls life and life more abundantly. I don't care if the preacher has a tear in his voice when he says it. I don't care if he squeezes your arm and pats you on the shoulder at the funeral of a loved one and spews that kind of filth and obscenity at you because he's impugning the very Savior that bought you with a price. Yes, God will get glory out of any and every situation. He's an opportunist. You better believe he will. Because he's God. But that doesn't mean he is the causation of those circumstances on situations from which we need deliverance. So Jesus arrives at Lazarus' house and Martha, ever the one to know in her mind what needs to be done and to be in control of the events around her, she, she doesn't tell Mary. Mary didn't stay behind. If Mary had known Jesus was there, she would have outran Martha. No kidding. But she does. She just sneaks out, and she goes out to meet Jesus. Now, Jesus, no shenanigans now. <laughs> we've, we've made all these arrangements. And the first thing she does is she tries to put a guilt trip on Jesus. Oh, if you would have been here. Have you ever accused God of showing up late? then you know what it is to to channel your inner Martha. You know what it is to uh, operate in a Martha mentality. You should have been here earlier, Jesus, but you just let Martha handle this from here. I got this from here. We, I know how to handle this. Well, let's see, see, 
see how far Martha's faith extends. Jesus maintains before Martha, he says, Lazarus will live. And suddenly Martha wants to have a theological discussion. She says, oh, yes, I know, I know, Jesus, Lazarus is going to live in the resurrection. Here's the Martha mentality. How many times does someone die of disease or some other misfortune, and those that pray for their deliverance stand over the casket and say, well, they're healed now, as though their prayer had been answered? Is this accurate thinking? Martha is consigning Lazarus' death and Jesus' late arrival and the consequences of his late arrival, Lazarus' expiring, to some theological eventuality. And Jesus breaks into her thinking, said, excuse me, Martha, if you could put down your book of systematic theology and all the excuses that you're making for <laughs> God and for yourself and everybody else. He says, I am the resurrection. Amen. Just like he said in Luke 17, that kingdom you're waiting to come is on the inside of you. It's not out there at the end of some linear timeline. That's the right. kingdom that you think you're waiting that will come through some, at the end of some linear timeline, guess what? It's on the inside of you. And he's saying the same thing to her. That theological eventuality you're putting your faith on, he's standing right in front of you in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever tried to get theological with God? Uh, he broke me a long time ago from saying, Scripture, please. He told me one time, he reminded me where Jesus said, Woe unto you lawyers. That word woe means a curse on you lawyers. And he said, You're not a lawyer, are you? Lawyers cite precedents. In other words, you know, well, Scripture, please. Like we're going to ask God to proof text his word to us. And so that's the Martha mentality. And Martha gets fed up and she goes to find Mary and she says secretly, because she doesn't want to mess up all these plans she's made, the master calls you. Jesus didn't call Mary. He didn't say one word to Martha about Mary. It's just what Jesus was saying she had no patience for. And she's thinking in her mind, oh, that's Mary talk. It's that Mary talk. I've heard them up late at night when they should have been in bed. And Mary should have been doing the dishes. And I've heard that kind of garbage. Mary, would you go out there and talk to him? Because she didn't want him in the house. Because she knew she'd lose control over the situation. So Martha is just done listening to what Jesus has to say. He's offering her a now deliverance in regard to something she's resigned herself to, the death of Lazarus. So look at Mary's response. She comes to Jesus and she falls at his feet worshiping him. She says the same thing to Martha. If you'd been here, my brother had not died. But she does it, with a far, she does it on her face with her tears. She's probably got her hands just gripped around his ankles and her tears falling on those dusty feet that have walked in from the Jordan. If you had been here, you see a far different attitude there. Uh, Martha, on the other hand, she didn't fall at Jesus' feet. She stood tall in her theological presumptions about Lazarus and his demise. Martha, no doubt, had decided, well, that's just Lazarus' time. She probably thought God looked down through time and saw Lazarus was going to get away from God, and so God took him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Had all kinds of... Or maybe she thought, well, he's healed now. The Martha mentality that will do anything except take now for an answer. Mm -hmm. She might have thought it was Lazarus' time, and after all, he's going to live into the resurrection. And to Martha, believing in God at this late stage, Date this late instance was just too inconvenient, too inappropriate for the situation. The funeral had been arranged. The mourners had arrived. The food was waiting after the wake. So let's forget all this resurrection stuff and get on with the funeral. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to be importuned? You've buried that dream. You've buried that hope. You've given up on plan A that God promised you and it seems like there's no raising back to life of that thing that just represents bitter disappointment to you. Are you willing to be importuned? Or interruptible, Denise says. <laughs> Are you willing in your situation to see God step in even at a late hour and inconvenience your unbelief? 
You cannot inconvenience faith, folks. Amen. But unbelief is inconvenienced every single day of the world. The answer to that challenge can mean the difference between life and death, in your circumstance, in your situation, the difference between a miracle and just living your life in an abyss of despair and disappointment, wondering why God. Father, thank you for your word today. I know it's just the first part of the story, but we are so thankful that our hearts are yielded to you as Mary's heart always recognized you and she worships you at your feet. And we are true worshipers of you, Jesus. The everything we need for resurrection life in our everyday life is already available on the inside of us. If we just check in with our Creator, if we check in with our Maker, we get to have all of the good of God because that's all you are is very, very good. And we worship you today and we honor you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.